Let's begin with the genesis of the story. And I know you've talked about this a little bit, but I was really uh, interested to read about how the idea of seeing uh, missing person's posters mm -hmm. when you were younger really sort of played on you. There is something really eerie about them. I find that anyway, and it's an image that seems to have stayed with you. We see it in the film uh, in, a, in a few uh, places. Tell me what it was sort of specifically about those images that has stayed with you and, and inspired this story. Um, that's a good question. I mean, it's also the age enhancement photographs. I mean, we cut out the scene where... <laughs> They're sort of where we actually see the enhanced, how they're making the enhanced image of cows, but it's this idea of uh, how we are expected to collectively respond to an image. It happened just you know the other day. I was in Bellwood Park, and there's a woman who's missing, a fifty-year-old woman, and and saw her image, and trying to you know um, trying to trying to understand whether or not that person is familiar. Right. Um, and, of course, suddenly being aware as you turn around and look at many people in a park that uh, you know, there's a heightened awareness of other people and um, whether or not they are this person who is, has created a huge hole in, in, in another group of people's lives and whether or not you can um, connect to that and um, help resolve that. Um, that is something that was very omnipresent in terms of my um, experience of that person, that young boy who went missing in Victoria, but that then combined with this uh, situation that happened here in Cornwall with the uh, pedophile ring investigation. And when the results of that were announced in 2009, I just found it so troubling. I found that, you know, it was the largest public investigation in Ontario history, right? And do you, are you familiar with this? Yes. Or the, yeah. And and I just you know I just when I started writing the script uh, it was in 2009 and just this idea of um, that everyone acknowledged there were these victims and and that something had happened, uh, but 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 you know um, you know this, this, these outrageous allegations that you know there was a secret cult and you know the highest levels of you know the community were involved and you know um, um, you know the priests and the and the lawyers and you know uh, very high placed you know public officials and it just seemed so outlandish and yet there was this one detective who really you know isolated himself and it was, uh, I guess the names Dunlop and Cornwall are in, still in the film it's the names of the detective um, but who kind of isolated himself because he believed that this was absolutely real he believed the victims and he became this sort of um, this this uh, this hero to the victims and, and yet was ostracized completely by you know his community uh, and the police uh, force around them and all that was very troubling and I just started writing this story and put it aside for a while because uh, it just felt too dark um, but then began to think about it as three couples you know a couple who are trying to um, understand you know what happened to their daughter uh, who love each other but cannot live because of the feelings of uh, guilt and responsibility, um, an act that we all understand when we see it, you know, leaving a 10-year-old girl alone mm -hmm. in a car in a remote area, we all understand how, 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 how anyone, one of us could have done that, and yet suddenly, you know, even though we know that you know, uh, Ryan um, is not responsible, we understand how the, how the detectives would, 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 um, focus on him first. I mean, that's what is done. And the only eyewitness, you know, didn't, wouldn't have seen her. And so all these things uh, began to fascinate me and how that would affect the, uh, his marriage. And um, so that couple, a couple that we felt should be together, but, but, but we're not. And then this idea of two other couples, a couple that we weren't sure whether or not they were, should be together, the detectives who form a relationship over the course of this case, and um, very odd sort of coupling in a way. And and this, and this, um, the more I did my investigation as to what actually happens with uh, uh, child uh, child exploitation unit, I mean, the more I realized, like, how, how I don't understand how they do how they do their jobs. I interviewed the detectives, but I got no clear answer. I mean, if you're going undercover with drugs or any one of a number of crimes, you get to actually 
have access to the materials so that you're able to 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 gain the trust of of other people you're trying to infiltrate. Uh, you, you, as a as a detective working in child exploitation, absolutely not. You cannot use children. You cannot use images of children, because that's that's absolutely forbidden. Which makes you think, well, how are they doing their job at all? I mean, when she says, you know, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. That's absolutely true. Um, and and this guy who goes rogue, um, and because he becomes obsessed about this case, and you know, felt real. But again, he suffers consequence over his bad decision. You know, he loses his lover. Uh, much like Ryan lost, you know, his wife, mm -hmm. and then this uh, other couple that you know should not be together. You know, a pedophile steals a, a child, uh, holds uh, holds her captive for eight years, and she becomes an adult in, the, in that time, and he loses any sort of interest in her. But it, it, in his mind, you know, they they they, they, they somehow have formed a, a relationship, and you know, you 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 sort of. As I'm always interested in my movies, you're just kind of seeing the characters as they see themselves. So, you know, he doesn't see himself as Castro or Fritzl. He sort of sees right. himself as this, you know, kind of a, kind of um, debonair, <laughs> oddly stylish guy, you know. Yeah. And and so, um, you know, when I began to see this, uh, these three couples and examining those relationships, it began to um, find a form. But it still took a long time to write it just because of the ambitions of, you know, what I was doing structurally and finding the tone and all that stuff. Well, and I would imagine that just the idea of spending a great deal of time working on this material in the film, we see Ryan Reynolds watch a screen, which we don't see, a, a, a computer screen, and he's mm -hmm. shown a video, and he's repulsed by it. It's mm -hmm. a terrible thing for him to see. Um, when you were delving into this, uh, it's a dark place to go. And yeah, you're going to be dark. there for... A yeah. couple of years, yeah, yeah. you know, two or three years. Do you ever, did you ever at, at any point go, you know what, maybe I have to put this away? No, I did. Well, no, I did. I, I, I did put it away. Um, and then I, but then I thought, you know, if, if I, if I, if I, I'm not going to obviously show the images of what they're dealing with, but if I find a kind of this fictitious sub cult that's actually watching um, the parents um, and, and watching, you know, kind of, playing games and torturing the parents, I could show that. And that would be a way of accessing, you know, the imagery and accessing, you know, the nature of, of the, the sharing and the observation um, without actually having to deal with, 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 with the with material you can't see. Um, yeah. But so unspeakably cruel, the idea of leaving a hairbrush or yeah. something behind for the mother to find, right. you know, seven, eight years later. Yeah. I, I, you know, of, because these kind of characters, these evil pedophile characters or, or they're criminals of some sort, we've seen lots, we've seen Hannibal Lecter, we've seen yeah. them do these physical things that are unspeakable, but for some reason they don't, uh, I guess maybe I'm desensitized. I see a lot of movies. I'm desensitized mm. to a certain extent to that kind of violence. But I found the idea of leaving those mementos, those little mm. trophies behind for the mother to be uh, unspeakably uh, mean. <laughs> yeah, but also, the, and then to have the daughter narrate them, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, we're not sure ever if, if we know what she's narrating uh, or whether or not he's maybe uh, listening to her memories and then finding these objects to illustrate, right. uh, I mean that's never, and I think it, it's that's what's happening. You know, is that he he's getting her to tell these stories, and um, I think you know when you look at, in my thinking, I mean it all started off you know as a way of trying to keep Cassandra happy. You know, he wanted she wanted to see the mother, and so he probably set up this camera. And then suddenly he had the idea. Well, my God, this is interesting, and and the idea of her narrating, and so it's it's distorted into this other place. It's become something else as a result. Uh, in much the same way that, you know, Sandra, Cassandra wants to see the father, and so he, you know, again, wants to keep Cassandra happy, kind of sets this up, but then observes that as well, and that'll be something else that'll be shared. And so it, it, it's, it's weirdly enough coming from a place where he's trying to actually give a gift, but the gift ultimately comes back. He's the ultimate narcissistic, you know, um, you know, um, uh, dare, dare I say lover? I mean, right. he's, he's, you know, anything he gives, he has to take back in this extreme way. And he has to almost punish himself for even, you know, thinking of it as an act of generosity. So he's unspeakably mean. You know, he's a very mean character. And I kind of resent people who 
kind of you know you know want to make him more human than he is because it, what he's doing is actually really the most um, you know uh, inexcusably mean thing possible. I mean it's 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 a type of uh, unimaginable psychological torture, um, and and uh, uh, and then to uh, enjoin you know the uh, you know the the daughter's uh, you know memory is is just again so unspeakable. But but yeah, we are living in that culture. I mean, we are living in a culture where I don't think it's unimaginable. I I think it's you know uh, I mean I mean I I, I guess. The idea of observed reality has become sort of something maybe of a cliche with my movies, but you know, um, it's it's absolutely where we are, and so you just sort of take that as a given, and then you go, well, how much further can, how much further could this go? And, you know, to the point where I think, you know, we we we're not sure, you know, how much of even you know what Ryan is experiencing or feeling is is, is also somehow uh, observed because that feeling is is being. Transplanted, you know, through his wife, through through Marais' character, onto him, you know, like uh, every scene we see with her seems to have this detached sort of POV, you know. So, so he begins to experience that too. Well, you you mentioned Ryan Reynolds. He has said in the interview. Uh, let me just pull up the quote here. He says that uh, working with. Uh, growing up as a kid in Canada, watching movies, uh, Adam McGoin was kind of a holy grail to me. He <laughs> well, says. That's, that's very sweet. I mean, I, 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 I uh, God, I'm not that much older than him, but I guess I am. Um, I was thinking about that, like growing up as a kid. I mean, I, I don't think he saw next to kin and family viewing <laughs> or speaking parts. I, he must be talking about starting with Exotica. I was 34, yeah. and he was 20. Uh, maybe I guess he was still a kid. Yeah, I, 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 I found that. Uh, really touching, um, uh, but I found you know his his commitment and his you know uh, his desire to be in the film was really what brought the whole project together. And to have someone who is that, you know, I knew it would be it would be uh, a rough ride on this character, but the audience should never feel that the police had any grounds for their suspicion. And and um, you know, as outlandish as that is, you know, I mean, I think the detectives are so. Um, Wrong-headed, you know, in a way. I mean, and uh, you know, they, uh, even though you know, the, you know, the, uh, they're taught to to look to the family first, and in this case, they have reason because you know the one suspect didn't see any, her in the car, and we understand in a way um, what why the detectives would focus or why Scott in particular would focus on him, but it's so it's so misguided and uh, again uh, unnecessarily cruel it seems that this, this couple is just being exposed to un- unimaginable cruelty i mean to 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 be uh, accused of having you know sold your daughter to, to better cause i mean like it's just inexcusable and yet you know uh, as he says he as scott says you know he likes to he likes to shake things up well the the casting of of reynolds i thought was really interesting because when he comes in to a film there is just something about him that is likable. It is just inbred in him, I think. So he really struck me as when we first meet him in the film, and they're before anything bad has happened, and he's they're going for pie, and they're at mm. the, the rink and the thing. He struck me as every guy I grew up with. Yeah. Small town, uh, you know, baseball cap on in the summer, trucker hat on in yeah. the winter, and you know the grub boots not tied up, probably all that stuff. Right? He was he to me uh, embodied that, and uh, with an actor like him. I think there's a lot of uh, goodwill that comes along with him, and you can uh, use a lot of shorthand with him. Just Ryan Reynolds, the the, the idea of him being in that movie uh, tells you something about the character, or something that we perceive about the character. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, in that way, he 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 is a star, right? Because he embodies this collective consciousness. There's a certain type of role that we see him in. I mean, it's interesting when you read his his that article because he seems to think he's a little bound by that as well. There's a kind of a, uh, and I'm not so sure, I'm not so sure if, you know, um, there isn't something uh, in this film that he, you know, redefines. But, you know, if I was to be honest, I would say the reason I got inspired about working with him was seeing Safe House, you know, and seeing, you know, uh, you know elements, you know, in that film, which, which were exciting to me. And also this very obscure film that no one's seen, which if you're, if you like Ryan's work, is called The Nines. And, I've seen that. Oh, yeah. yeah, and I thought he was really quite excellent in that too. It just, you know, it just in terms of his, 
ability to play these three wildly different characters in that, and you know. I, I, I have somehow have a, a hard time picturing you going into the theater and buying a ticket for Safe House. Uh, you know, I've, I've people say that, but I, 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 I'm, I'm a pretty uh, Catholic when it comes to my uh, film taste. I mean, I'm not, I was never a sci fi person. Like, it was never about, you know, it was always like The Godfather instead of Star Wars. Right. But, 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 um, but I, 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 you know, um, I, uh, yeah, I see a lot of films. Not as much many as I used to. I mean, I just saw a film yesterday that someone said I should look at, which I didn't see, called Stay. Have you seen this film? Like one of Ryan Reynolds' first movies? Uh, Stay, I it was, think so. It was, it was uh, um, uh, Mark Forster directed it in 2005. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I was like, surprised I didn't see that. You know, uh, yeah, I'm still trying to figure it all out. But, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've seen it, but I know, I yeah. know of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and shooting, you, you wanted to get... Uh, the, the film kind of reminded me of of uh, not only Canadian films but of like this new wave of sort of Swedish and Danish films that we're seeing that that use this kind of icy uh, terrain as sort of almost a character in the film as well yeah, and yeah. you shot in Sudbury you shot there's a shot of Clifton Hill yeah. I was trying to figure out in my head later on thinking about it like was it shot in Niagara Falls I don't yeah it's it supposed to be set in Niagara around yeah. Niagara, the, the escarpment I mean that was the idea that it's really the escarpment but I fell in love with the uh, in Sudbury you get these uh, black birches against the snow which mm -hmm. I thought just so graphic and right. and um, so we shot a lot of it there but then we shot a lot of it in, in Niagara Falls I mean that's what you're seeing through the hotel window yeah, um, is, that, yeah. is that real? yeah 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 wow. yeah, wow. yeah 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 uh, we, we shot those scenes there um, and um, and that's Clifton Hill obviously as well did, did you go to the Houdini Museum or any of, of that of course <laughs> of course I mean, and they have a museum of crime of course right. so 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 we all we dutifully went to the museum of crime after shooting every day yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been for years, but I used to always have to make a little pilgrimage, and and, and uh, I I used to love like the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, and I loved uh, the displays that were clearly had seen better days. You know. Well, you know, there's someone who um, they sold um, uh, someone uh, who passed away, Bill Jameson. Did you ever know Bill? No. Uh, who who bought. Um, uh, one of those museums was closing up, and he bought uh, all of their stuff to only to find that one of the mummies was an actual mummy, oh. and it was worth like untold amounts of money. And somehow it had sort of slipped through the cracks. Everyone assumed it was fake, but it had this strange uh, pedigree. Yeah. Is he the fellow that had all the shrunken heads? Yes, yeah, that's yeah, the guy. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. passed away. Yeah, that's right. uh, but he, uh, yeah, he he got his uh, mummy from from Niagara Falls. Wow. From from it wasn't Ripley's. So there was another museum like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For me, well, it was Ripley. Yeah. Well, it's such a, you know, just the idea of Niagara Falls. You forget that people live there. Well, uh, well, the other thing that was the other kind of image that uh, you were talking about the missing poster. Uh, the other image that haunted me uh, was this image that was published many years ago. Of uh, uh, it was a it was a, a room, a hotel room, where they digitally erased the child and asked anyone if they could, you know, recognize where this room might be. Do you remember this was in, in the papers? This was maybe even longer ago, eight years ago, nine years ago, and someone identified it as as Euro Disney, right. and uh, and that's uh, where it was, and they were, they were able to actually find. And, you know, the child who had been exploited through this, you know, again, you know, instead of a missing picture, it was like a missing kind of um, room. And, uh, um, but the tra Niagara Falls is also very attractive because it's such a huge transit, you know, mm -hmm. like this transitory sort of community there. You know, people, you know, coming in and out of that city. Uh, and so it felt appropriate, you know, um, that, you know, the, the, the people who are leaving those objects behind and, um, you know, are obviously people who are just, you know, booking specifically for those rooms and living those things and, and, and they wouldn't be traced. Uh, not to speak of the fact that she, you know, doesn't, you know, um, she thinks she's going mad. Yeah. We, we, had, we, had, we, had, we, we, we had that scene and then we took it out because it seemed too, didn't seem necessary, but, you know, she's not reporting it because she just, she can't imagine that this is real. Right. Although, yeah, yeah. I, I wondered that as well when she found the the hairbrush. I think it's the hairbrush she finds first. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And when she finds the hairbrush and she walks around with it, and the way that she walks through the room mm -hmm. with it, holding mm -hmm. it, it's almost like. For me, it felt like she was like a little girl almost holding the like she had become Cass for a second, holding this thing. The way she was looking at it, and 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 I wondered at that moment, like, is that hairbrush real? Or, or are we just seeing a figment of her imagination, or is she, is she uh, imagining that she is cast with the hairbrush? Oh, cool. Well, that's, yeah. that's cool. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you. Uh, glad you 
you felt that. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, I think it's sort of in that, it's in that zone, right? I mean, um, you know, even when you see Ryan sort of reacting to her saying, you know, that she found it, you know, yeah. you know, he's he's not concerned. He almost feels as though she's, you know, she's she's in she's in that place mentally and and uh, and doesn't really address it uh, seriously. Well, yeah. I mean, he, he sort of. You would think that if it if it was something that could really be a clue, if he yeah. thought that if it was something that could really be a clue or something that was going to be of significance, that he would have a very strong reaction. But I got the sense that after eight years, and he had probably gotten a lot of weird calls from her, <laughs> you know, over the time, and and that maybe he was just like oh, just another one. There probably isn't even really a hairbrush. Uh, that's that's great for sure. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I think it's 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 difficult uh, to deal with uh, uh, someone who is suffering so much, and um, you know, to um, you know, when when you see the extent of her her fluctuations. I mean, I thought she did such a great job in that scene where she's explaining to Ryan, you know, that what she's seen, and she seems almost happy yeah. until it, it occurs to her what she's actually seen, what is it, what it actually means. Yeah. So he, she calls him, and then, you know, in the space of, like, a minute, you know, what is this joyousness, weird joyousness, you know, turns into this rage, you know, which is what he's living with all the time, you know, um, and, 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 you know, he becomes inured to it, right, like anyone does. I, I think so, and he's also fighting his own rage issues as well, and trying to, I think, keep those in check at the same time trying to deal with hers, and I mean, right. it's so complicated, <laughs> the, yeah. the feelings that go on around all that, that it, it, yeah. um, it's very difficult to uh, to imagine. Well, especially when you think about it over eight years as well, mm -hmm. you know, like that to me is, um, you know, and, and you, see, you see these meetings that happen, you know, every year with Rosario, and, you know, she's almost a different person every time. Yeah. Because there's these intervals, right? And so. Well, um, that's uh, that, that's. I won't keep you for any longer. I've kept you uh, in the middle of the. Well, thank you. I time. mean, thank you. I, it's, it's it's great to have this conversation. Well, I I, 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 uh, I haven't had enough of them, so it's great to have a, a conversation.